This is Ecotricity's Ecotech Roundup show from Aotearoa's first and only climate positive certified renewable electricity provider. We only source from wind, hydro and solar and we are the leading supplier of electricity to electric vehicles in Aotearoa. Switch today at ecotricity.co.nz. Welcome back to another roundup of news from the world of clean cars and green energy. Thanks for joining me. And as you can see, I am still in a splint, but my hand is not broken. So that's good news, right? We start today's show with a promised reveal of Porsche's most powerful Porsche Taycan to date, the Porsche Taycan Turbo GT. While it doesn't have a turbo, because electric, the Taycan Turbo GT follows Porsche's naming convention to become the fastest, quickest and most powerful Taycan on sale. As with other Turbo GT variants of Porsche vehicles, this version gets the full treatment from the track with suspension and brake package appropriate for a vehicle with 580 kilowatts at the wheels and a small button noted attack mode that boosts it to over 815 kilowatts and gives the car a 2.2 second sprint time. Want more power? There's a Vizark package available for those with the money and believe me, it is expensive. Even in base spec, it's a Nissan Leaf shy of a quarter million. Sticking with high performance and certainly not budget-oriented cars, Hyundai also released official pricing this week for the all-new Ioniq 5N, the first Ioniq model to wear the N badge. Priced from US$66,100 before mandatory fees, it might seem like it's quite the premium to pay for a performance version of a car that's available for more than US$20,000 less. But consider the power that this thing outputs, more than 600 horses or 440 kilowatts, and it's actually quite the interesting proposition for those who have the money and the driving skills to handle that kind of power. And given that it's only one second slower than the aforementioned Taycan Turbo GT, I think I know which I'd prefer to send out on a track day, at least, if I was paying. It's no secret that EV startup Fisker hasn't been in the most rosy of financial health in recent months, with its quarterly earnings causing some concern among Wall Street investors. This week, those investors likely got another bit of bad news when the Wall Street Journal reported that Fisker has hired a consulting firm and a law firm to prepare for potential bankruptcy filing. Fisker has published an official statement stating, quote, as a matter of company policy, Fisker does not comment on market rumours and speculation. However, Fisker often works with outsized advisors to help manage its business and assist in developing and executing strategies. Continuing, Fisker is focused on raising additional capital and engaging in a strategic partnership with a large automaker. The company is also continuing to pursue its shift to a dealer partnership model in both North America and Europe. The leadership team is laser focused on these efforts, end quote. But to my mind, that lengthy statement doesn't fully address concerns raised. What do you think? Modern EVs pretty much have some form of connected online functionality, allowing you to get over-the-air software updates and much more. But this week, the New York Times suggested that those connected cars are doing something else, sharing your driving data. It tells the story of a 2022 Chevrolet Bolt EV owner whose insurance premium jumped by 21% recently, and upon digging further, it transpired that he had inadvertently used the smartphone app for his car to turn on insurance data gathering. Therefore, his Bolt had been dutifully reporting his driving behaviour to a third-party broker who, in turn, was then making that data available to insurance companies because he had ostensibly said yes. I know the headlines this week suggested something far more sinister and nefarious was going on, but a quick reminder, in most markets around the world, using telematics to report driving data back to your insurance companies through a broker is an opt-in service, not an opt-out service. And if you'd like us to cover this in more detail in a dedicated video, let me know in the down below. Volkswagen held a double world premiere this week, launching the GTX trim variants of both the ID3 and ID7. 
The GTX, which is Volkswagen's EV equivalent to the lauded GTI performance badge, is a sign that both the ID3 and ID7 GTX variants have a little more oomph, with the ID3 GTX getting a 207 kilowatt rear wheel drivetrain and the ID3 GTX performance getting 236 kilowatts. Not bad at all for such a small vehicle. At the same time, the ID7 GTX gets 246 kilowatts at the wheels, which is far less impressive considering the size difference. But then again, it's worth noting it's not a hot hatch, but rather a hot wagon. Sadly, though, neither variants of these two cars will make it to US shores. So if you're west of Ireland, let's add both to the forbidden fruit pile, eh? When Tesla officially began deliveries of its Cybertruck at the tail end of last year, it warned customers that it would not be happy if they turned around and flipped their Cybertruck Foundation Series vehicles for maximum profit. Since then, we've seen several Cybertrucks get sold on the open market, including one that was reportedly acquired by Ford for reverse engineering for quite a high fee. But this week, Tesla appears to be fighting back with one Cybertruck Owners Club forum member, noting that after they'd sold their first Cybertruck for a handsome profit, they'd been contacted by their Tesla store leader who said that their two other Cybertruck reservations had been cancelled and noting that future reservations from Tesla would be cancelled without a refund. It's not the first time that customers has found out the hard way that Tesla remembers, and I doubt it will be the last. It's just one week since Rivian unveiled the R2 electric SUV and surprised us with the R3 and R3X hatches, but the reverberations of the event are still very much being felt. Aside from the massive social media coup that Rivian managed to secure by unveiling the R3 and R3X, vehicles that I would argue seemed to create more buzz among car fans than the R2, Rivian confirmed that in less than 24 hours, it managed to secure 68,000 pre-reservations from customers wanting to put down $100 to get in line to buy an R2, which, by my maths, is $6.8 million. A not insignificant boost to funding for Rivian. Obviously, there's a long way to go before the Rivian R2 reaches production-ready status, but it is worth reiterating that Rivian has decided to postpone its Georgia factory plans in order to get R2s out of the door from its Illinois production facility sooner rather than later. If you're in the US, you probably know that you have just under a month to go before you have to submit your annual tax returns to the IRS. And if you haven't already filed, you are probably trying to maximize those tax savings. Unless you're very lucky and you have a tax rebate coming, the chances are you're going to need to pay some extra tax or you may have already paid a shed load of tax. But it's frankly well known that the more money you have, the more likely it is that you'll make use of tax loopholes and pay a fancy accountant so you don't have to pay any more than you need to. And that goes for corporations just as well as very wealthy individuals. So this week, we weren't surprised to hear new reporting from The Guardian that suggests there is a massive gap in how much executives at companies get paid versus companies' actual tax bills. And at the top of the list was Tesla, which recorded a $1 million tax rebate over the last five years from 2018 to 2022, despite making more than $4.4 billion in profits. 2.5 of which then went to Tesla executive pay. But look, Tesla's not the only company doing this. Ford was also highlighted for having paid its executives $355 million over the same five-year period and raised $7.7 .7 billion in profit while only paying $121 million in tax. But I think this kind of proves my point. Tax loopholes need to go. If you've lived in Europe, the chances are you've heard of the Euro emission standards, standards that have historically governed emissions of new cars, trucks and buses made and sold in the EU. For the past few years, the European Parliament has been bashing out the latest iteration of those standards, known as Euro 7, and this week those standards were finally given the green light. 
On the face of it, you might think this is a good thing, since every time Euro standards have been revised, they've historically become more stringent. But this time, thanks primarily to vocal opposition from a handful of member countries, emission standards under Euro 7 haven't changed for cars, with Euro 6 emission standards effectively passed through for passenger vehicles. Instead, there's been an emphasis being placed on larger vehicles like buses and trucks, as well as a brand new requirement limiting brake particulate emissions for all vehicles and a new requirement for battery electric and hybrid cars pertaining to battery lifespan and capacity retention. While a sizable amount of everyone's global carbon emissions comes from personal transportation, the carbon emissions from freight is truly mind-boggling, especially in the US, where trucks tend to be responsible for the majority of freight haulage. And in order to lower those emissions, the US federal government has published the first of its strategies to help transition road freight from smelly, polluting diesel big rigs to electric ones. It's the first of a number of policy plans we can expect over the year, and this one focuses on first targeting the 4% of roads in the US that see 75% of all truck traffic. It proposes establishing electric highways serviced by big rig capable charging infrastructure, with the majority of initial funding focusing on the east and west coasts, the Rust Belt, south and east Texas, and areas surrounding major cities like large trucking hubs that are Salt Lake City, Phoenix, Tucson, Colorado, and El Paso. I would personally love to see more electric trains in the US moving freight, but it is the US, and I live here. Many people seem strangely allergic to the concept of choo-choos. Before we get to the last two stories, I have a quick question. Are you in the market for a new EV? Because if you are, and you live in Aotearoa, you should totally check out our very own buyer's guide at ecotricity.co.nz. It is packed with all the information you need to pick a car that's right for you and includes plenty of details about available vehicles, daily life with an EV, and so much more. So follow the link below and start your journey today. While the Kiwi general election happened not so long ago, in other parts of the world, it is definitely election year. And there's been a lot of nonsense spewing around as politicians and people vie for political supremacy, often at the cost of EVs. And sadly, here in the US, where I happen to, to be based, there's a big anti-EV push on the YouTube, in the newspapers, on the radio and TV. And of course also on the campaign trail, with the now presumptive Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump using EVs as one of his many vectors to create a them versus us mentality in his followers. This week, in addition to all the other weird stuff he's been sprouting, he tried claiming multiple times that electric vehicles are terrible, don't go far, cost too much, and will all be made in China, stating that, quote, it's not even a possibility to go all electric, end quote. Given that he also hinted that he was now friends with Elon Musk, it's just a weird vibe for both of them. If someone can tell us when and where we migrated into the alternative mirror universe, I would, I would love to know because I'd quite like to go back to the prime timeline if that's okay with you. And finally, some good news to finish off with. In the last few years, we've been really eagerly watching Swedish company Candela bring more and more all-electric boats and ferries to market, offering something for both private and corporate customers. And this week, in New Zealand, a new electric ferry was announced for Lake Manapuri, which will dramatically decrease travel time across the lake. What's really cool about this service, though, is that because of the chosen boat, a Candela P12 being a hydrofoil, the boat will lift above the water, meaning it won't disturb the famous clear waters and keep the many indigenous species that live in the water undisturbed. There are already some great electric ferry services across Aotearoa, and it's great to see a new one planned from 2026. And while I'm at it, why not tell me your favourite body of water in out there are that you would love to see electrified with a zero emission ferry service. Let us know in the down below. And on that note, we are in fact done for the day. Before I go though, do make sure you hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on the latest in EV news from the channel. And of course, if you haven't switched yet, it's high time to switch to Ataro's first and only climate positive certified renewable electricity provider. It's super easy to make the switch. And in doing so, you'll help Ataro wean itself off dirty energy and onto clean green power that will keep the land beautiful 
for generations to come. I'll be back as usual next week, but in the meantime, be sure to check out other great content on this channel, including some lovely videos from the amazing Gavin Kiwi EV Shoebridge. I'm Nikki Gordon Bloomfield. Enjoy the rest of your week. Kakite! See you next time. Bye.